All right. I'm going to open it up. Good evening and welcome. Our lecture tonight features Sante Matteo, Professor Emeritus of Italian Studies at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. He was born in Italy in 1948 and immigrated to the United States with his family in 1958. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree in French from Kenyon College in 1971. He was drafted in the US Army, served for two years, and then pursued graduate studies in French and Italian, receiving a Master's of Arts in French from Miami University, and an MA and a PhD in Italian from Johns Hopkins University. From 1976 to 1979, he was an instructor of Italian at Miami University. From 1980 to 1989, he taught Italian language, culture, and literature, and French and Italian cinema at Brigham Young University. In 1989, he returned to Miami University where he served as professor and coordinator of Italian studies. He served as editor of the journal Italian Culture and has over 100 publications, including seven books, four in English and three in Italian. He has continued to publish creative works, including stories, poems, and essays since his retirement in 2015. He is joined by Simone Dubrovic, Associate Professor of Italian at Kenyon College. Simone received a degree in Italian literature at the University Delghi Studio, Carlo Bo in Urbino, Italy, and a Master's of Arts arts and French at Miami University, where he worked with Sante. He has published studies on the Renaissance on 19th and 20th century French and Italian literature, on Italian cinema, and on the interplay between literature and visual arts. He is a member of the Academy of Raffaello in Urbino, Italy, an institution founded in 1869 with the mission of promoting scholarly works focused on Renaissance painter Raffaello Sanzio, aimed at preserving and nurturing his legacy. The college is grateful to both of you for joining us tonight, and I'll turn it over to Sante to start the program. Grazie, Sean. Buonasera, cari amici. I see some puzzle faces. Is this supposed to be in English? I, I hope so. <laughs> it's, it's great to see so many uh, familiar faces, some that I haven't seen in uh, 50 years or, or, or so. Uh, thank you for being here, and uh, thanks to, uh, to Sean for, um, and Lindsay for setting this, um, this up. Um, I'm going to start by um, showing, I, I think I'll start from the end and then go back to the, uh, to the beginning. So let's see if I can uh, share my screen and show you these, uh, these two books, which are the most recent books. The one on the left, Radici Sporadiche, Letteratura, Viaggi, Migrazioni, so sporadic roots, uh, literature, travels, and migration. 
and uh, the one on the right, the more more recent one. So that one, um, sporadic roots, was 2006, and uh, the one on the right is uh, 2019. Il secondo occhio di Ulisse, saggi di letteratura e cultura italiana. Uh, the Second Eye of Ulysses, um, Essays in Italian Literature and Culture. I start with these because um, these are primarily the work of Simone. Um, he edit, edited uh, them. Uh, the second one, the most recent one, was his idea. He had to twist my arm to, uh, to finally go, go along and, uh, and do them. And I think that if I uh, leave any sort of legacy, particularly in Italy, of course, it's, uh, it's because of these uh, works and it's all due to Simone. And I wanna start here because of the ideas that are already contained in the titles of uh, the book. So sporadic roots, first of all, A sporadic. So it's meant to be uh, ambivalent sporadic temporally means every once in a while, spatially means uh, here and there, uh, so it's sporadic in that sense. But the root of the word is another botanical metaphor, spores, which in some of my studies I used in opposition to the metaphor of roots, which particularly in uh, migration studies is a very, very strong metaphor. So strong that in a way, Metaphors are very useful because they allow us to express something in uh, an efficient way, but if they become very strong, they are also restrictive. That we only think of migration in terms of roots or being uprooted, and it ends up being a very uh, traumatic or violent metaphor at times. So if you see migrants as uprooted and always looking for their roots, uh, it presents migration as something uh, that is traumatic and uh, it's a loss. So I started writing about uh, the literature of migration, uh, proposing that perhaps we can also use the metaphor of spores. Uh, spores also produce plants, but they're free to roam throughout the world and they grow uh, wherever they, they land. So the idea and the essays in this book have to do with migration and travel um, and proposing the idea of spores, seeing migration as something positive and not something that is always a loss, uh, uh, um, a truncation uh, of something. The other one, the second eye of Ulysses, the idea is somewhat similar. The second eye of Ulysses um, takes us back to the encounter between Ulysses and the Cyclops. Cyclops has only one eye, as opposed to Ulysses, who has two eyes. And we have uh, the fact that we have two eyes allows us to see in perspective. Otherwise, with one eye, we don't see perspective. Everything is always on the, on the surface. So if we expand that metaphor of seeing in perspective, spatially, of course, we see what's behind and what's in front. Temporally, we see what comes first and what comes later. Experientially, we see causes and effects. Um, so when I started deploying the references, the allusions to Ulysses in, uh, in my essays, it was to take advantage of that, suggesting that it's the travel, it's the migration, it's the fact that Ulysses has traveled and seen many societies that gives him two eyes, that allows him to see a perspective. And um, as opposed to the Cyclops, Polyphemus, who is on his island, has been isolated and does not have the advantage of this uh, two-eyed uh, perspective. Um, so that's the operative metaphor in the essays contained in, the, in that second book. You can see that both of them have to do with, um, with travel, with migration. And in a way, they all have to do with my own 
migrations. So an odyssey back to Kenyan or back to Gambir, fortunately, it's not literal. It's not I who went back to Gambir. I say fortunately, because if you remember at the end of the Odyssey, when Ulysses does get back to Ithaca, it's not a pretty sight, right? It's, it's a bloodbath, it's a slaughter. He ends up uh, killing all the suitors of uh, Penelope. So I'm glad that in my stead, it's been Simone who has gone to, uh, to Gambier and, and to Kenya instead of me. So let me then go back to my experience um, in Gambier and how that is entangled with Simone's story and how he got to Gambier. I uh, am an immigrant, as uh, Sean said. Um, my family came to the States when I was almost 10 years old. And I think because of that, I suffer from or benefit from having an immigrant syndrome, which is probably similar to what they now call the imposter syndrome. Um, always feeling a little bit out of place. You, you join a society that's not yours, you're not comfortable with, uh, in it. And so you're always on a perch slightly on the outside, which, which has a lot of benefits that uh, looking in from the outside uh, gives you a certain distance so that you don't get up, get caught up in, uh, in obsessions and causes and, and so on. So that happened when uh, I came 10 years old. That happened again when I went to Kenya because I came from an inner city school in Cleveland, uh, the east side of Cleveland. Uh, Collinwood was on the edge of Huff, which was the uh, black neighborhood in, uh, in Cleveland. And what Collinwood was known for in the mid 60s, the late 60s, the, 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 the race uh, riots that happened then because of busing, the civil rights movement and so on. So going from that, to the monastic experience that was Kenyan at the time, which was all male in 1967 when, uh, when I started, was a radical shift. So it was a second migration of, uh, uh, of sorts. And again, I was an outsider uh, looking, looking in. Um, there's a lot more to tell. Uh, I almost flunked out of I had a scholarship, uh, and, but I almost flunked out my uh, first two years and uh, Dean Edwards, Tom Edwards uh, straightened me out. And I ended up majoring in French, partly from his advice because it put me under the wing of Professor Harvey who became my mentor mm -hmm. and uh, allowed me to, to graduate. I think when I uh, saw Dean Edwards, my grade point average was 1.4. So I was going to lose my scholarship and risk flunking out. Instead, because of uh, his aid and uh, the mentorship of uh, Professor Harvey, I ended up graduating cum laude, um, which then allowed me to proceed. Anyway, two things happened in 1969 and 1970, my, my junior year. One was the draft lottery in December of 1969, the first draft lottery. Um, which I think covered uh, people be born between 1944 and 1950, something, something like that. We had, um, we had uh, our own lottery in Manning Hall uh, for those who were eligible for the, the draft. We all put in uh, a dollar and the one with the lowest number, the one who was going to be drafted, uh, would win the pool. And um, I won. My lucky number was 13, which was the lowest uh, number. So I was sure that I would be drafted upon graduation from, uh, from Kenya. 
by the way, I wrote uh, a story uh, about that, a short story. So if anyone wants to read that story, you can just Google my name and then put lottery after it and you'll get a link to the story. It's flash fiction, it's under a thousand words. So you can read it, uh, you can read it quickly. Um, the second thing that happened at the end of the, the junior year was that uh, Professor Harvey asked me what I was going to do that summer. I said, well, I'll probably work in a factory or work construction uh, again to, to make some money. And he said, well, how would you like to go to Middlebury College in the Italian school there? Middlebury had a full immersion language program. I think it was eight weeks, maybe, maybe seven. Well, you had to sign a pledge to speak only in the, the language. They had a French school, a German school. I think they had uh, Chinese, Spanish and Italian. Um, and I had to serve as a waiter. All the meals were taken together by the students with the instructor speaking Italian the whole time. Uh, so if I served as a, as a waiter, I got free tuition. I got to go for, for free. It was a graduate program. It was a master's program and I was still an undergraduate. So I wasn't taking the courses for credit. So I ended up going. And it was wonderful. It was like summer summer camp because I wasn't taking it for grades or, or credit. I was just having fun playing volleyball against the Germans and uh, going to Lake Champlain and, uh, and afternoons. And I had three courses, uh, one on Italian language, which reintroduced me to the language, one on Renaissance art. It was my first introduction to, uh, to art, to Italian art, and it was wonderful eye-opening, and one on literature, uh, on Italo Svevo, a novelist from the turn of the century, end of 19th, early 20th uh, century. And uh, because I, I like that, I like that reading, I like that course a lot as, uh, as well. And I love the irony in Svevo, and I tended to reproduce it in the papers and the essays that I wrote for the professor, Eduardo Saccone. At the end of the summer, Saccone comes up to me and uh, said, um, so where, where are you going to do your doctorate? He assumed that I was a master's student in Italian as, as all the other students were. Uh, I said, I'm, I'm not going to do a doctorate. I'm, I'm an undergraduate. Uh, and I, I don't know anything about graduate school. I, I had no attention. And he said, well, it's too bad because I really like the way you write, the way you think, the way you read. And I would love to have you at Johns Hopkins. I said, no, I'm going to be drafted. So forget about it. And I forgot about it. And I was drafted uh, afterwards. And Toward the end of my two years, I discovered at the end of my two years, the GI Bill was doubled. And I discovered that if I went back to school, I could get out of the army three months early. So I remember this guy Saccone telling me that he wanted me at Johns Hopkins. I wrote to him and uh, I said, this is a situation, you know, um, you can get me out of the army three months early if, uh, if you, Accept me at uh, school. I, I knew nothing. I hadn't. I hadn't read any Italian literature except what I read in the fourth grade in Italy, and then that summer with uh, with Sacco. I hadn't read Dante. I hadn't read Arios, Manzoni. I hadn't read anything. Um, he was in Italy, so it took a long time for him to answer. When he finally answered, uh, not only did he accept me, but he offered me a fellowship. I had to teach Italian and to give me full tuition plus a stipend. And with a GI Bill, I was putting money in the bank. So I was making more money than I would have made with, uh, with a job. So my intention was to stay only one semester because I was a fish out of water. The other students there, this was a doctoral program. The other students had a master's and they had done their undergraduate degree in Italian. I had the fourth grade, and that one course in, uh, in Middlebury that one summer. So again, on the outside looking in, uh, a tourist of uh, sorts. And I was only gonna be one semester and then leave and find, find, find something to, to do for real. 
Instead, uh, I found out, we found out that our second semester would be spent in Florence, all of us, the, the cohort, and there were only three of us who joined the doctoral program that fall. Uh, we were all supposed to go to Florence. We kept our fellowship. Johns Hopkins has a villa there and we're gonna take our courses uh, there. So I said, oh, well, gee, <laughs> you know, maybe I should go, if they're not gonna kick me out, I'll go for that as well. So I ended up going for, for that. And it's a much longer story than, uh, than that, but I ended up finishing the doctoral program with many deviations along the, uh, the way and ended up being uh, an Italian professor without ever having planned to become uh, an Italian professor. So that when I retired almost six years ago in 2015, I was still wondering what to do when I grew up because I hadn't made these plans myself. Okay. Backing up, when I got back to Kenyon after Middlebury, Professor Harvey talked me into teaching Italian for the Gambier Experimental College. I thought it was called the Gambier Evening College, and Murray Horowitz corrected me, I, I think, unless I'm mixed up again, uh, to teach Italian. And I said, okay. And he and his wife took that course. So this was my, uh, this was fall of uh, 1970 and spring of 1971. He took that course and then he got a sabbatical and went to Pisa for a semester to improve, to perfect his Italian. When he got back, he started offering Italian as an independent study to uh, the students. Eventually when there was demand with the women there, uh, there was more demand for languages in general and for, uh, for Italian. I think uh, he started hiring part-time people from Ohio State in the master's program. And then eventually there was enough demand to uh, create a position in Italian, which was occupied by Professor Patricia Lynn Richards in 19, late 1980s, 1987, I think. And she built up the program uh, so that 20 years later, in 2008, a second position was, uh, was created. And 2008 was when Simone finished his master's here at Miami University as my teaching uh, assistant. So, we, for, let me also explain that this was, these were the years of a, a, a tremendous brain drain in, uh, in Italy. Uh, the university uh, system had, uh, had suffered greatly and the best and the brightest were having, just could not find positions in uh, the Italian university. So many of them ended up uh, coming here. So Simone, had already published, he already has a research doctorate. Um, what many like him ended up doing was in order to, to wait until things open up and then he was doing a PhD in addition to which was redundant. And I hated for him to have to do that because he was brilliant. He would have been more brilliant than any of the professors uh, I would have sent him to in, in the United States. So. Um, we ended up calling um, those places that uh, to find out if they recognized the Italian doctorate, research doctorate, as the equivalent of a PhD. And Kenyon did. Professor Richards did. He applied and he was hired. That was in 2008, so going on 13 years, 12 years, 12 and a half years ago. And I was delighted, a little jealous because my dream would have been to go back and teach uh, at Kenya, uh, but I was delighted. And uh, I think it has turned out to be a, a beautiful marriage. Um, Kenyan, Kenyan students, the atmosphere I think is very, very conducive to 
uh, his type of scholarship and vice versa. And um, he emailed me uh, a week or so ago to inform me that uh, he has just found out that he's been promoted to full professor. Yay! Congratulations. That's it. And uh, <laughs> now I'll turn the floor over to him to say about his experience uh, at, um, at Kenya. And then if there's time, we'll come back and talk about some of the scholarship uh, behind these two books. So what, I, what can I say? I mean, I, I want to thank Sante. I mean, also to rectify that I didn't do anything because the, the books, both books were ready. I can say that it's interesting to recall that when he picked me up at the airport the first time I set foot in the United States, he was wearing a polo shirt with a shield of Canyon College, so like a sign of destiny. But a particularly, a particularly happy um, and generous destiny was for me to work with him, really, because I have to say that when I came to, um, when I went to Miami in 2007, uh, the first book, Sporadic Roots, Radici Sporadiche, was already there, was ready. But Sante was really hesitant to publish it because uh, then he, he told me he, he wasn't sure that um, the book had the level of consistency of a scholarly book because there was a significant part at the very beginning um, with uh, autobiographical pages. But at that time, probably, he saw in this young, uh, um, um, young scholar from Italy, probably a, a projection of himself or, or a projection of the same problems he faced uh, as an expatriate. And through my fresh gaze with respect to this problem of, of being an expatriate, he entrusted me the editing of the book. So also he gave me the opportunity because that, that's part of his generosity, I would say. He gave me the opportunity to, to process, to work through this experience uh, while working uh, at his book, basically. So in, in a, it's interesting to see how these two books are connected to each other because I would say that the first book, Sporadic Roots, is uh, a sort of a first draft of the second. Because it's true that there is an inconsistency, um, which in my opinion is not even a defect, is a quality of the book. Because there are some books which are not perfect, but they, they, they give you something authentic, you know, a, a testimony of an experience. And that was the first book. But the second one, in a way, was more, scholarly because uh, really mm, entailed uh, an overview on Sante's scholarly production, uh, which was extremely consistent because it was revolving around the problem of, uh, of Italy, how to define Italy, you know. So it's interesting that the theme of the journey of the travel uh, was going end by end with, uh, um, with Italy as a country. And the same contradiction that you are facing when you change country as an expatriate, you know, is a process of constant construction and deconstruction. Is also the, at the very core of Italy as as a country. You know, uh, that, uh, sometimes I I make jokes about uh, how Sante, you know, sounds like Dante in a way because truly. In, he was for us from Italy because I was not the first one to work with him. There were other people. He really, he really guided us, not just, uh, um, uh, you know, in this transition of uh, trying to understand the United States, but also trying to understand the Italy left behind. So I have to say that really was, for me, studying and working with Santi was a second university in a way, university uh, which gave me the opportunity to redefine something that I had taken for granted in terms of how to perceive Italy as a country. And uh, this second book, uh, the second book of Ulysses, the second eye of Ulysses, really is a masterful, um, a masterful reflection um, from the Middle Age to the 20th century 
of this ongoing process of Italy as a country suspended between basically two, two poles, two polarities uh, co coexisting with each other, you know, an attempt to progress, to open up to future, to basically to, to create also um, possibilities of renovation, of renovating itself and that an intimate tendency to regress. So basically Italy uh, has an image of the mind, I would say, uh, really um, suspended between the creation of ideal forms, uh, ideal uh, structures, uh, that is what Sante uh, calls the, centri the centripetal, the centripetal uh, movement, you know, that, that is Dante trying to encompass everything in, in a sort of a transcendence. And instead, the centrifugal aspect of embracing this contradiction, this chaotic uh, perception of things, the, 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 the fracture of things uh, that is embodied by Marco Polo. Dante and Marco Polo are the first two people who really um, opened this second book, but they somehow define this uh, contradiction of Italy, which is still going on through the Renaissance, uh, through Romanticism, through Risorgimento, it was actually the movement of creating Italy as a unified country up to the 20th century with, uh, you know, the experiences of writers such as Pierpaolo Pasolini or uh, Paolo Volponi, a great Italian writer that still is not very well known in the United States and was also a friend of, uh, of Sante. And about Volponi, you know, we can talk about Volponi, for example, for his link to Urbino. Now, Urbino is the, one of the most important Italian courts of the Renaissance. And the Renaissance too is uh, basically twofold, you know, it's, um, it's composed of uh, uh, these uh, attempt to understand the complexities of the human, of the human being, but at the same time, the Renaissance itself is trapped within uh, the, um, mm, the construction of a false space, if you think about the perspective, no? the perspective as a symbolic form, to quote Panofsky, is, uh, uh, is, is this anthropocentric uh, sort of point of view to put in order the world, the inconsistency, the contradictions of the world, but at the same time by creating a space that is completely fictitious. And Paolo Volponi, who basically was, uh, was born in Urbino, really embodied all these contradictions. No? You, you know, re remember that Urbino, the court of the Duke of Urbino, worked the Piero della Francesca, who was the first one to, to be the theorist of the prospettiva, the perspective. So I think this book, this book really is um, an incredible occasion, um, a wonderful occasion also for people who think to know what Italy is, um, in order to really rethink about uh, what we normally associate to Italy, its stereotypes, uh, its, uh, you know, uh, the things we, th we think are Italian. Uh, and we understand actually that Italy doesn't mean anything in a way. It's just um, a country with an, a tremendous uh, uh, artistic and literary heritage that now is an heritage to the world, you know, a fresh, uh, you know, really a fresh and honest uh, gaze on the contradiction of uh, inherent to mankind, you know, to the humankind. And all these things really, I, I was able to understand and, uh, and, you know, through this opportunity of working with Sante, uh, these books were really for me an, um, an opportunity to grow, really not just as a scholar, but also as a human being, which I think is more important at times. I, I don't know, I mean, I don't really have anything, anything else to say. It would be nice maybe to, uh, to open the floor to questions. I see faces of uh, students, of former students of mine, and I'm very happy because also I have to say, <clears throat> I, I say hi to, to everyone, of course, I mean, to every of them, every, every guest, but in particular to my former students, because it's also thanks to them that I understood how important it is for American youth to, 
uh, to read Italian literary text or to watch Italian movies, because really they can, they can see through these different perspectives something that concerns themselves. So Italy really uh, has an opportunity not to be an Italian that doesn't mean anything, but to really strip, to strip the veil uh, on uh, some important contradictions and uh, some awareness of the complexities of the clashes in our mind, you know, this coexistence of construction and deconstruction, uh, coming up with ideal forms and confronting with fracture and chaos, I think are extremely important, especially today. Before we go to questions, um, I wonder if I could take a few minutes to, to show some, uh, some images from a presentation I did at Kenyon. Um, I was invited by Simone after uh, he was there, Marco Polo and, and Dante to explain the, the difference between uh, centripetal and centrifugal. And uh, is that all right? Or I'll try not to, uh, not to be too long, so. So this was in, in 2010, but I'll actually use a later version, which has a much cooler title, The Globetrotter and the Astronaut uh, Traveling to the Ends of the Earth with Marco Polo or Journeying to the Stars with, uh, with Dante. Um, I think if, if I have made a contribution to Italian studies, it's probably the coupling of Marco Polo and, and Dante, which are, are never talked about. And it's, it's really weird because they're contemporaries. They lived at the same time. Their books are both about a travel with the author as the, uh, as the traveler. And they were written within just a few years of uh, each other, uh, near e each other. And I think it's probably kind of willful blindness uh, um, to keep them separate, uh, perhaps. Um, actually, let me go back just to see the, the dates. So Marco Polo, 1254 to 1324, Dante, 1265 from 1321. Uh, Marco Polo was from Venice and uh, Dante was from, uh, from Florence. Dante was exiled from, uh, from Florence uh, and traveled through much of Italy, particularly the north, uh, spent a lot of time in Verona, near Venice, and also went to Venice a few times, including just before he died. Um, he was living in Ravenna, went to Venice as an ambassador for the court of Ravenna, uh, got sick, probably going through the marshes on the uh, got malaria and died on his way back to Ravenna. So his last stop was actually Venice when Marco Polo was there, was still alive. Um, I've just written a short story that will be published, a letter from Beatrice who survives and she tells a tale that they actually met and that uh, Dante decided to write the Divine Comedy because he hated the travels of Marco Polo because he saw them as dangerous because they describe the marvels of this world, whereas Dante wanted to show the uh... so let's see. These are the journeys of the polo. So before Marco went with his uh, father and uncle, his father and uncle had been to uh, to the Far East uh, before. And uh, the second time they took Marco with him when he was 17 and he spent 20 years, uh, 20 years there. So a horizontal journey uh, on the surface of, uh, of the earth. Uh, they were merchants. They didn't have uh, classical training. They looked at the world with the eyes of merchants, measuring, uh, looking at the uh, quality of things, the value of, uh, of things. Um, Dante, was writing a book called The Convivio, had written a good portion of it, when all of a sudden in 1306, he abandons that project and decides to write the Divine Comedy. 
And I suggest in this, uh, in this fictional story that it, it was an antidote to Marco Polo's travels, which had been published in 1299, so only uh, five, six years before. And this is Dante's journey. It's a vertical journey. So he starts here at the bottom, Jerusalem. So the, uh, the earth is round. Uh, it is a sphere for, for Dante. Um, but half of it is only ocean, is only water, and half of it has land. So um, he enters down into hell, goes to the center of the earth through hell, makes his way up this uh, gut that takes him to the other side of the planet where Mount Purgatory is, climbs up Mount Purgatory, and jumps into the, um, into the heavens. So this is still the Ptolemaic uh, version of, um, of the cosmos, the earth at the, at the center, and then um, the circles of the planets, and then the fixed stars, and the Empyrean, which is where God dwells, which is outside of the physical universe. So a vertical journey. And this play between horizontal and vertical is similar to the play between roots, which are vertical, they're fixed in, in place, and the plant grows up vertically from the roots, and spores, which are more horizontal. And the suggestion is that perhaps culture works the same way as nature does, as the laws of physics, uh, which have to find an equilibrium between the forces that expel um, fission on the molecular level and fusion. Fusion destroys something, fission destroys something. So you have to find a balance in order for matter to exist. Gravity on a bigger level, gravity as opposed to the, 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 nuclear, the nuclear force. So when I suggest these things, spores instead of roots, it, it's not that spores are a better metaphor it's a way of correcting that it's both this and that. So it's not that Marco Polo's travels are better than Dante's or Dante's better than Marco Polo. It's that both these tendencies, a centrifugal and a centripetal force are at work in shaping a culture, any culture, and in this case, uh, Italian culture. So we need, we need both. Um, so this is Dante and Beatrice uh, as they make their way up to the Empyrean. Um, Dante has to take a little final exam before they get to the, to the fixed stars. So Beatrice says, okay, look back the way uh, we came. And he looks through all the, uh, uh, the spheres that they've encountered. And there in the, uh, in the middle, is the earth. So uh, in this system, it is uh, Ptolemaic, the earth is the center of everything, but it's a tiny little speck that Dante sees. And the more famous, uh, among the more famous verses of the Divine Comedy is when he looks back and he says, I see the sun, I see the moon, and there way down at the bottom, this little speck over which we fight so much, and it's this insignificant little speck which brings to mind a lot of uh, what the astronauts say about the Earth when they see it from outer space, this little blue marble lost in the darkness of space that seems so fragile, and yet we fight all these wars over it, something that uh, is so insignificant and so vulnerable to, to things. This is uh, at the bottom there. Uh, he finally sees the threshing floor that maketh us so proud to me revolving with the eternal twins was all apparent made from hill to, uh, to harbor. I traveled on the Silk Road uh, tracing Marco Polo. Um, nomadic cultures we ran about with yurts um, indicate the spores, culture that is movable as in spores rather than, uh, than rooted which is still the case in Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and, and these places. This is a, a market that Marco Polo would have seen in Kashgar.
Uh, this is in Osh, the local products, but also pasta of all kinds. And I don't know if you can see up on top, the apron from, uh, from Italy, suggesting that the Silk Road, even in Roman times, was an avenue of exchange, even if individuals did not go all the way across from China to Spain, goods did. Silk made its way all the way from China to Spain in, in Roman uh, times. So exchange is what enriches culture. It's not just roots, cultivating your own roots. It's also allowing spores to come in and enrich your, your culture. When we get to, uh, to Turkey or near Turkey, all of a sudden we start seeing things in stone rather than in adobe or yurts made of uh, animal skins. And stone is there from 2,000, 3,000 years ago. So it's a way of being rooted to something because something lasts for 2,000 years as opposed to yurts, which only last, uh, they're organic. What lasts in their case is not the material but the idea, the form that's passed on from generation to, uh, to generation, which is another way of creating uh, culture. This is Cappadocia. Um, this was uh, an abandoned and uh, broken caravanserai. The caravanserais were the places where caravans stopped along the, the Silk Road to rest for, for the night. And look at the elements. So this was constructed from previous buildings. They brought in stones from previous buildings. So here you have a motif of the eternal river, which is an Eastern motif that you find in the, uh, in the Far East. On this stone, there's the cross of Malta, which is a, a Christian motif. So this might've come from uh, uh, some kind of a church in the area in the Middle East. And here you have columns that are classical, uh, suggesting a Greco-Roman uh, influence. So here it's like a puzzle. They all come together in one wall, which is now uh, is just a ruin. But to show how culture is enriched by bringing in elements from many different uh, places. The Renaissance... So the Renaissance, much of what we know of uh, the Renaissance, the great names, Raffaello, Michelangelo, Leonardo, are in the late 1400s, early 1500s. The word Renaissance was used by Vasari in the early 1500s. And I think that too, and then Machiavelli, uh, uh, there's a famous letter where Machiavelli says, my real life is when I go home in the evening, take off my dirty clothes of, of the day, uh, put on a toga, and I communicate with my real friends who are the classical authors. So going back to, uh, to the classics, which is what Dante did with the Divine Comedy. So not only going up to paradise, but uh, recuperating the Greco-Roman culture as the root, as the foundation for Italian culture for European culture. The Renaissance does the, the same thing with people like Machiavelli. And putting aside uh, Christopher Columbus the same way that Marco Polo was pushed aside. Not pushed aside because Marco Polo is probably the most famous Italian. Christopher Columbus is more famous than, uh, than Vasari, for example. But pushed aside as cultural agents uh, as literary figures, as agents of Italian culture, preferring instead to, so here, this is a, the School of Athens by Raffaello. First of all, you see that the classical st structures, the classical architecture that contains everything. So putting everything in a culture, in a classical context, Greco, Roman classical context, refusing the spores that come from the Far East or from the Middle East or from Islam, even though a lot of the science and the philosophy at the time did come from Islam, including um, navigation that made Columbus's journal journey possible. That was uh, a contribution from, uh, from Islam. 
This is uh, also Raffaello, Mount Parnassus. We look at a close up. These are the, uh, the, the poets, the epic poets. This is Homer, blind Homer. That's Virgil to his, uh, to his left. And that's Dante. So a straight, linear, a vertical line from Greece to Rome to, to Florence, as opposed to uh, what Columbus uh, represented. In the meantime, in, in Venice, Venice was, uh, had its own empire in the Mediterranean. So its contacts with the Near East uh, were much more important, much more significant than those of uh, Florence, or, uh, which was uh, inland. So this is from the Bellini family in, in Florence, uh, in uh, Venice, uh, a famous uh, family of, of great painters of, of the Renaissance. And here it's a portrait of Mehmet the Conqueror who conquered Constantinople and turned it uh, um, into Istanbul. So at the end of the Byzantine Empire, which was the extension of the Roman Empire that then became the Ottoman Empire uh, ruled by the uh, the Ottomans, who were Turkic Turks. So this portrait, no. So this is another artist from Ferrara. So an Italian artist, Ferrara is north uh, east near Venice, um, who paints a Middle Eastern scribe, showing that the boundaries between Italy and the Middle East were permeable that they weren't closed off, that there was not an uh, exchange between them. And here we have a Persian painter echoing, or both are echoing something that uh, came to them from a different source. And this is a, a motif that's uh, reproduced. This is a picture I took. You see on the rug there, it's the same, uh, the same figure. And even the man playing uh, has the same pose as what was represented uh, back in the Renaissance by both Middle Eastern and uh, Italian artists. So this is uh, Columbus who reproduces Marco Polo's co contribution to Italian culture, European culture. And then the same thing is reproduced in the Risorgimento, a word that's a lot like Rinascimento, rebirth, Renaissance, Risorgimento is resurgence, which uh, consists of the wars of independence and unification of Italy in the 19th century. Italy didn't become a unified nation until 1860, 1861, the parliament met for the first time. So as a nation, Italy is almost a century younger than the United States is. And the two main figures um, in, in that Risorgimento, resurgence, are Garibaldi on the left and King Victor Emmanuel Piedmont, who then becomes the first king of Italy on the, uh, on the right. Uh, Garibaldi was a sailor, sailed all over the Mediterranean and all over the world. He was exiled, so he spent two years in the United States, became a citizen of the United States, and then in South America where he participated in wars of independence in uh, Brazil, uh, Uruguay, Argentina, uh, freeing the slaves, went back to Italy to participate in the wars of independence there. So he represents a hybrid figure. This is a picture of him and one of the slaves he liberated in uh, Brazil, who then went back to Italy to fight in the war for the Republic of Rome in 1849 and was killed there. So among the, the patriots, the martyrs who died for the cause of a unified Italy, we have this black African Brazilian who followed Garibaldi. And we see Garibaldi dressed in a, a poncho from the South American Pampas. This is the, uh, the great meeting between Garibaldi, who with his militia had conquered Sicily in the south of Italy, and the army of King Victor Emmanuel had conquered the north. They met near Naples. Uh, people weren't sure what was going to happen because Garibaldi wanted a republic. He was against the monarchy. 
and this was a monarch. Instead, Garibaldi uh, said, I, I uh, greet you, I salute you, King of Italy. So he ceded the, the territory he had conquered to uh, Victor Emmanuel in order to create a unified Italy. But look at the sartorial. He, King Victor Emmanuel in European garb and Garibaldi with his gaucho pancho, his gaucho uh, um, pants, a fez from his time in the uh, in North, uh, North Africa when he was a sailor. Even uh, he became a senator, even in the Senate where everyone else was wearing their uh, tuxedos and morning coats, he wore his, uh, his poncho. Garibaldi became world famous. Uh, the picture I uh, went over was a ticker tape parade in London where, over, where hundreds of thousand people uh, met to, to greet him. He became famous because his fame coincided with the birth of international journalism, with the birth of uh, photography, uh, lithography, uh, mass media. Uh, in other words, and uh, he was uh, a hero. So this is a photograph, not a painting. And we see him with his poncho, with his fez from, uh, from North Africa. So he represents a kind of hybridity brought in by foreign influences that Marco Polo represented. But because it's dangerous, he had to be quieted. So this is the uh, a cartoon showing one of the first prime ministers of a unified Italy sewing his mouth shut because what he represented was dangerous. He was uh, given his own island, Caprera, which became a, essentially a prison where he was isolated there. And, um, oops, I've gone on too long. Um, this, I think, these are the four founding fathers of a unified Italy. Here we have the vertical axis, the Roman, the Roman wolf, the she-wolf of Rome, Romulus and Remus, with King Victor Emmanuel in the same vertical line rooted in that culture. Whereas Giuseppe Mazzini, an exiled uh, patriot, and Giuseppe Garibaldi are on the horizontal axis on, on the outside. But what I claim is their contribution uh, is as important as the contribution. Not, not that one is better th than the other, but Italy has benefited from having deep, strong roots that go back, as well as spores that have come from the outside that have enriched it in all these uh, movements. And uh, this is a bus we traveled on when I was on the Silk Road trip, the Marco Polo bus. So this is our group with our European roots, the way we looked at the beginning. And this is how we looked afterwards, show how much more vital uh, a horizontal journey following Marco Polo's uh, steps can, uh, can be. Okay, I'm sorry, I took uh, much longer than I intended uh, with, uh, with that, so I'll shut up. Sante, I think uh, we could invite questions at this time, if there were some, either to put in the chat room or to unmute yourself and uh, ask the question live. I have a question. I'm Tom from, I was graduated in 1975 and I had Professor Harvey too. I love Kenyon and thank you so much for your presentation. Today, um, uh, uh, I think it's safe to say that um, uh, Florence is vertical and Venice is still somewhat horizontal. Do you have any thoughts about that? I don't know what it was like in 1300. I, I was, I'm not that old. Yes, I, uh, I guess I would, uh, I would agree with, uh, with that and then uh, Florence has become the the emblem. It's it's you know the home of uh, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio of the three crowns of, uh, of Italian literature, the home of Italian language, and and so on. But 
it's also the Mecca for foreign students. Um, at one point, there were over 100 universities that had their program in Florence. Um, so, you know, that I, I think is sporadic in a way. It, it does bring in, uh, bring in spores. Um, what do you think, Simone? What I think, I think that, you know, as you show in your book, that the centripetal and the centrifugal can overlap easily, especially in a country uh, so problematic like Italy. So I would say uh, that usually the, you know, the, the oppositions can coexist. So probably Florence, yes, is uh, for the most part uh, centripetal because you know she's it is so concerned about preserving uh, this sort of pride of uh, being actually the origin of the Italian language because that is what it is uh, but at the same time you know with this interest of uh, of foreigners on Florence it, it can it can expand to uh, other possibilities for example no I think that it's important always to include in what we what we say about Italy the experience of foreigners in Italy because there is an interesting section in the book by Sante of uh, for example how important was the um, the years spent in Italy for James Joyce I mean James Joyce uh, thanks to the uh, plurilingualism of Italy because you know he understood that Italy didn't exist even as a language and, you know, a sort of, uh, how can I say, illumination for, for, the, um, for the experiments he did in the Ulysses. So you see, I think Italy is interesting because it can be um, um, a trigger, a trigger for foreigners in order to understand more about themselves, thanks to this flexibility of its identity. That I think is important always to remember. But coming back to your question, I think it's true that Venice probably it's more open. It's also a door to the, yeah. to the Eastern world in a way. But they yes. are both part of the same yes. contradiction of this country. I don't know if I reply to your question, if you, if you are happy with my answer or not. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I like the idea of, um, sure. even though Venice may appear to be vertical, you're right. There are many global influences. Uh, and but I don't know what it was like in the 1300s and if that, there was any, anything like that. I, I suppose, um, I guess Dante was an inlander in a way, and then Marco Polo was, was by the sea. So even if even if the, the the cityscapes weren't weren't like that, there, there was still that that aspect of it. So th thank you, Sante, Jim Eastman here. I, I thought it was interesting, and it sort of follows the the line that uh, Tom was talking about: the porosity of boundaries between Italy and the Middle East that you referred to in the fourteen hundreds. Um, I find that a, a little surprising, I guess, because uh, certainly uh, the Middle East, in it, now we credit it with the source of the bubonic plague on 1347, uh, brought from uh, Crimea to Venice. It, there, that may not have been understood then, uh, but there didn't appear to be animosity between Italy and the Ottoman Turks and Italy and the Middle East, especially in Venice. The, there was, my unmuted, uh, there was definite, uh, definitely animosity. So Marco Polo, his travels were in the 1200s. Hmm. Uh, and I think there was a window there where such travels were, were possible. Uh, that window closed probably with the death of Kublai Khan. Mm. So the Mongols had taken over. The Mongol, Mongols had invaded Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan, who was the, uh, the Khan when, when Marco was there, was a great grandson of, uh, of Genghis Khan. Mm -hmm. uh, they 
had conquered, I mean, their empire was much vaster than the Roman Empire had, uh, had been. Uh, and that facilitated trade. Mm. And that's what allowed the Polos, and it wasn't just the Polos. Uh, I uh, jumped over some, some slides that show um, tombstones in, in, in China of both Genoese, because Genoa was the other great maritime republic in the Mediterranean. On the Mediterranean side, whereas Venice is on the Adriatic side, and they had constant wars against each other. That's how Marco Polo came to write his book, which he didn't actually write. When he went back to, to Venice, he participated in the wars between Venice and Genoa, who was captured, was made prisoner for two years in Genoa. And one of his fellow prisoners was a writer of romances, Rusticello da Pisa from Pisa, which was the other great maritime republic uh, rival of both uh, Genoa and uh, and Marco Polo dictated talked about his travels to Rusticello, who then wrote it wrote it down. So it's it's uh, it's secondhand. But with the death of Kublai Khan, all the Khanates of his relatives began to to separate that that centripetal force uh, fell apart. And it became much harder to travel from one end of that vast empire to the other. Islam became uh, more important. And the animosity between the Christians and the Muslims prevented more exchange and more travel. So that, that window closed for, uh, for, for a long time. Mm. But it only closed in the sense that individuals like Marco Polo were no longer able to do the whole route. The merchandise continued to flow along the Silk Road. And with, with the merchandise, there's all the main merchandise are ideas, religious ideas, artistic ideas, yeah. um, social um, ideas. <clears throat> so I think that, <clears throat> that exchange and interchange continued to be there. It's just not as pronounced as it was in certain in certain moments. Thanks. Sante. Oh. John. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Good to see you again. Good to see Good you. Good to see all the other brothers and Mike Ulrey and uh, all the other, and Tommy, Tommy Moore. Um, Sante, how important do you think it was for your Kenyan education that you had come from Italy? Or what type of problems did that cause? <clears throat> well, you know, as I said, probably the, the immigrant syndrome feeling Okay. Never fully at home in, in either place, because when I went back, I didn't go back to Italy until uh, just before I came to Kenya, uh, right. the summer before 1967. I'd been gone for nine years at that point, and I felt more out of place in Italy at that point than even in my own hometown. Really? Um, okay. Because, you know, I, I was a spore that had developed... Uh, as a mushroom in, in, in yep. the United States. And I dressed like an American, I walked like an American. Uh, when I walked in Rome and the vendors saw me, they would automatically start speaking in English because you know, they saw that, that I was uh, American. So I think that, uh, that syndrome stayed, uh, stayed with me. What, I mean, Kenyan w was, was very interesting for me. Um, I had been a very good student. My, my parents uh, valued education because I had very little. My mother only went through the third grade in, in our hometown, which was a lot for girls. Most girls of her generation didn't have school at all. My father was a stonemason, 
So he was middle class, he was a craftsman. So he went through the fifth grade, which was about as high as you could get in the hometown. It only had an elementary school, even in their day. Um, so they valued education and they pushed it. And I was a good, obedient boy uh, and methodical in my studies, uh, did all my assignments on, uh, on time, got start, started getting straight A's, reinforced by them, reinforced by the whole community. Because when we moved to Cleveland, there was a community, not just a little Italy in Collinwood, but a little Petrella, Petrella is my hometown. There were about 20 families just from my hometown. Huh? So we had a little hometown, we spoke our dialect. And as Simone said, the linguistic situation in Italy is very, very complex. The dialects of each little town are not Italian dialects, they're Latin dialects. So that my, when I speak my dialect, no one in other parts of Italy can understand me. If I go to Rome, I had no idea what I'm saying. Anyway, so with them, uh, we always spoke the, uh, the the dialect. But I was a good student. I got straight A's. They cheered me on. Um, in Cleveland, they gave you baseball tickets if you got straight A's. My father was a big baseball <laughs> fan, so he made me get straight A's. I got straight A's. I kept getting straight A's through about the 11th grade. And then I had an existential crisis, existential angst, started reading Sartre and Camus and realized that it was all meaningless. I was going to die. The earth was going to die. The sun was going to die in 5 billion years. The galaxy was going to collapse. It didn't mean anything. Why bother? But by that time, I went to Collinwood High School, which was both junior high and high school. So I'd been there for five years as a straight A student. No matter how poorly I did, if I didn't do the assignments, they kept me giving me A's because I was an A student. And uh, anyway, I this crisis became worse my senior year. I graduated valedictorian first in, in, in my class simply because I was surfing along. And I was recruited by Yale, by Brown. They took me to lunch. I didn't know that. Because I was an inner city student, yeah. Oh, yeah. right? Not from a prep school. Yeah. And I think this is 67. So universities were starting to branch out, uh, wanted to have more representation. Yep. And, you know, I, I, I fit the bill. But my crisis, and then I went back to Italy. My crisis was such that I never, I didn't apply to any of these places. I was sort of paralyzed. And I had um, a teacher at Collinwood, Ray Spossett. I don't know if he's uh, here. He, he went to Kenya. He says, before uh, any of this, he says, you have to go to Kenya. You belong in Kenya. And he took me to Kenya. I had a, an interview with uh, Lanny Warner. I said, great, yeah, they offered me a scholarship, Philander Chase scholarship. I got a scholarship from the, the, the Cleveland Press, so it didn't cost me anything. And I went back to Italy, and I got a letter from, uh, from uh, Ray Spossett saying, you know, they're happy to have you there, but you have to apply. I hadn't even applied, or I hadn't finished the, the application. So I finally applied, and I got accepted there, and as I said, I almost flunked out because this yeah. procrastination stayed with me. Plus, there was a civil rights movement, the war in Vietnam, which seemed much more important things to devote my attention and time to than my studies. You know, that, that seems so bourgeois to, to worry about my grades at, the, uh, at this point. Um, until Tom Edwards and I worked things out and I was able to refine myself, but not you know, it was a different self that I had found. Yeah. If anything, what I think Kenyan prepared me to do, and I love being there. I learned as much or more from the both sessions with my fellow students that I did in the, in the classroom. I think that I also learn how to 
procrastinate in such a way <laughs> that it worked for me. You know, uh, rather so at, at a certain point, rather than, and I got through uh, Kenyon by pulling all nighters. You know, the night before doing things, and I kept doing that through much of my career. And at first, feeling guilty about it. Because, I, you know, if I devoted a little more time to this, I could have done such a better job. The article would have been so much better, uh, a little more research. But eventually I came to terms with it. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's the way I do things. Uh, I was sure I was going to be kicked out of Kenyon. I was sure I was going to uh, be kicked out of uh, Johns Hopkins. I was sure I was going to be kicked out of my first job. Instead, I got praised. I got rewards, I got lauded. So at a certain point I said, well, okay, that's the way I do things. Uh, I'll do them at the last minute. Uh, it'll be half-assed, but whatever works. So Santi, Santi, sorry, may I interject a second? So you see that you are the embodiment that you wanted to be centrifugal and you are centripetal. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Right, so the <laughs> The right, the right equilibrium, always on the verge of implosion from too much centripality and on the, version of, on the verge of explosion from uh, centrifugality, I suppose. Well, when uh, Asante, when I knew you and you were a student at Kenyon, I thought you were the smartest person I'd ever met. That's the other thing. I fool people a lot, yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> Sante, that's Donna, Canty, Parker, and I was one of your first uh, students in your first Italian class. And between my second and third year of Kenyan, I went to Italy in the summer and I used whatever you taught me then and in many, many trips to Italy since then. And it's probably the most uh, useful education I got in Kenyan because wow. the other things were intellectual and yours was fantastic for meeting people and walking around the cities and having my little, you know, tourist Italian, I call it, I can get, you know, understood. So thank you. And it's wonderful, wonderful to wonderful. see you. Thank you. That's, and that's all wonderful. Years. Thanks. I, I'll never forget that class. So. Tante, I think we have time for, for one last question before we wrap things up. We do have a couple in the chat if you would like to um, to address one of those. Uh, one of the questions is, um, do you see any similarities between the ideas discussed in this presentation and Calvini, Calvino's philosophy ideas? Oh, I'm gonna butcher this. On Le Cittia Invisibili? Le Città Invisibili, the Invisible Cities, which uh, is about Marco Polo. It's a, it's a series of conversations between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan. And it's precisely about that uh, that sort of thing. Um, Marco Polo, so Kublai Khan has this vast, enormous empire. So the the, the empire is 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 Russia, Mongolia. Uh, they conquered China, so it's uh, all of China, all the way to uh, to the Middle East, practically to, to to Europe. So India, it's all part of the Mongol Empire. And Marco Polo and Kublai Khan is centripetal. He never moves. He's, he's, he's there. And Marco Polo is the one who goes around to these different places and describes these cities, these fantastic cities. They're all different. They're all uh, uh, the imagination. And it's precisely that, that tension and how you can make that tension work that for this moment, at least, the centripetal force of a Kublai Khan, of an empire, allowed Marco Polo and others to have a passport that enabled them to travel everywhere in this vast empire freely, without having to cross borders. And yet, at the same time, to be exposed to all these very, very different cultures with different ways of buildings, different kind of money, different kind of uh, different everything. Um, so yes, uh, 
thank you for that uh, for that mention. That's uh, it's a wonderful book to to read if you haven't read it, and I think it, uh, it encapsulates a lot of the, the tensions that Simone and I have been talking about. It, it's interesting, uh, Sante, to think about the Khan and Mongol Empire was and still is the largest empire ever established in the world, both in terms of geographical size and population. So it had a tremendous influence. Um, and there's some genetic information that suggests that in the Eurasian area, one of seven people are related to Genghis. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Dante, we've put the um, <clears throat> excuse me. We put the link to our um, session on February twenty third in the in the chat function. Um, for those of you that were joining us in a week, Sante is going to um, moderate a conversation with Simone and Daniel Mark Epstein from the class of seventy. Um, and so we invite you to click on that link and register for that session. And Sante, any closing remarks or Simone? Well, uh, it's, it's been a delight to, to see uh, all these uh, great, wonderful faces from, uh, from the past. You all still uh, look very good, by the way. Uh, and a particular delight to be able to, uh, to share this uh, space and this time with, uh, with Simone. Um, and I'm grateful that it, uh, it was Kenyon that uh, ultimately brought us together. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, really. And uh, I want to thank Sante for all the exaggerations about me. So you see, he is very generous. But in any case, it was a pleasure. And it was a pleasure to see everyone and my former students in particular. Grazie mille, professore. Ciao.